Hello, good afternoon. Happy Sunday to everybody out here. Um, I am broadcasting this to you from the wonderful South Lake Tahoe. Had to get out of the city. Um, you know, capitalism is a disease, disease system. So it's always good to get away from the centers of it as much as you possibly can. So up here, we're bike riding, having a wonderful time. So it's really glad you all are able to join us for this very critical topic we're going to address today, Stop Doing Police Work Against Movements. And as always, um, we want to ensure that you're experiencing your highest level of mental, physical, and spiritual health today and every day. And we also start by acknowledging the indigenous peoples of the Western Hemisphere. And when we say that, we don't just mean we acknowledge them like, hey, they're there, they're still here. We say that because we are actively involved in political organizing work to not only support them, but to educate the African masses and everybody else who will listen that this land belongs to the indigenous people of the Western Hemisphere, and they have to get their land back. And we need to help them get their land back. It's their land. It's not yours. Like, stop chanting whose streets are streets, not your streets. It's their streets. If someone came in your house talking about whose house, my house, you would you would be overwhelmed with anger. So stop saying that. It's their streets, their beautiful Lake Tahoe, their beautiful pine trees. You you and I are just here. Okay, so that's just objective objective fact. So we always acknowledge the indigenous people of the Western Hemisphere, and of course. We acknowledge our African ancestors who fought from the eastern shores, the Horn of Africa, all the way out to the west coast of the Western Hemisphere. They fought for our liberation. They fought for our freedom. They never stopped fighting. And anybody that says they didn't fight just doesn't know our history. So we got to stop people saying things like, I'm not my ancestors. That's the most ridiculous thing you could say. If you have any type of resistant spirit in your consciousness, it's exactly because you are your ancestors. So let's always pay proper respect to our ancestors. They deserve it. They've done nothing but provide us the blueprint so that we can be free. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, with this very important topic, we're really happy you all have joined us today for this, and we look forward to being able to share what we have with you um, about stop doing police work against movements. And so first, as always, we do our brief introduction. My name is Jamu Umi, longtime organizer, All African People's Revolutionary Party. I've been able to organize for the party on three continents in the Caribbean, continue to do that constantly engaging in this work. And along with me today is my outstanding daughter, Shakura, who is uh, has grown up in the All African People's Revolutionary Party's Young Pioneer Institute. So she's that's all she's known is revolutionary Pan-Africanism since she was born and could talk and has evolved and is um, moving towards finishing her doctorate degree in public health communication is an outstanding activist around poor women, particularly African women's health issues um, where she is. So we applaud her work and we are honored and glad that she is able to do this with us today. And we're thankful for her. Um, and just to understand who we are when we say we're the all African people's revolutionary party, because most people's are most people's consciousness is that if it's not, you know, if the bourgeois system isn't recognizing it, then it either doesn't exist or it's not valid. So the bourgeois system is never going to recognize revolutionary organization because they don't want that to exist because for that to exist and get stronger means they are getting weaker and the stronger we get, the closer they get to elimination. So they're always going to act like this doesn't exist. The only thing that's legitimate is what exists inside of the capitalist system. So we have to tell you that we are an independent revolutionary Pan-African political party based in Africa, but existing all over the world. And our work is not on television, nor do we need to have it on television because our, our work is about day-to-day -day revolutionary organizing work. And so what that looks like is if you look at the handbook of revolutionary warfare, 
that was written by Kwame Nkrumah that's in the picture there. In that book, Nkrumah talked about the need to unite African revolutionaries on the ground in Africa into one unified body. And so that's our work over the last 50 years of our existence. All the logos you see there are various organizations in different parts of Africa, the Pan-Africanist Congress, of Azania, or what you call South Africa. The name is Azania, it's a Zulu word that means land of the black people. The Germans called it South Africa. So we don't recognize that. It's Azania. So the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania, the African Party for Independence of Guinea-Bissau, PIGC in Guinea-Bissau, the Democratic Party of Guinea in Guinea, the Azanian People's Organization in Azania, Amilcar Cabral, I school school in Nigeria, uh, Zimbabwe Movement for Pan-African Socialists, uh, Pan-African Union, Sierra Leone, there are a number of groups that we and other organizations work with, and we all have the same objective, one unified socialist Africa, which is the definition of Pan-Africanism. So that's what we're all working for. And we have relationships with organizations all over the world who are working for their own liberation. The Irish Republic Socialist National Liberation Movement, the Filipino National Liberation Movement, the Palestinian National Liberation Movement. And as I mentioned, the indigenous people of the Western Hemisphere and their movement for justice and forward progress. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. I guess the white supremacists decided they weren't going to join us today. Um, so we'll move forward without them or those of you who are undercover white supremacists will still move forward either way. So we're glad those of you are here that are sincere about human progress and forward movement. And we'll start by turning it over to Shakura. Okay, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much. As always, it is a pleasure to be here. Each week I try to figure out what light I have in my world to kind of deal with all the anger and um, sadness that I feel. And the seminar is definitely a glimmer of some of that light that I try to find each and every week. So I thank you all for allowing me to be with you. And without the party, I definitely would not be able to say that I am the woman I am today. So very grateful for that foundational path that has been laid for me. So on that note, I'd like to draw your attention to the photos that you see on the left, and I want you to think about how the primary role of every police agency within the capitalist system, from local police departments all the way up to the so-called federal law enforcement agencies, is to protect the capitalist system at all cost. Since our premise is that the capitalist system fuels itself from exploiting Africa, Africans, indigenous peoples, and all of the oppressed humanity, by default, this means that the interests of the masses of humanity in general, and African people in particular, are diametrically opposed to the capitalist system. This is true, whether we believe it or recognize it. Consequently, the role of all police agencies is to disrupt, dismantle, and completely destroy any organization advocating for progress for any segment of oppressed humanity. In other words, that means that a variety of organizations from the National Congolese Movement, MNC in the Congo, Central Africa, to the American Indian Movement in the United Snakes has suffered as a result of police agency operations against them. For the MNC, what that looks like is the US Central Intelligence Agency, also known as the CIA, doing everything it could to undermine the MNC's election of Patrice Lumumba as the prime minister for the Congo for an independent Congo. The reality is that the Congo then and today remains the world's highest concentration of natural resources. Everything from cobalt for internet devices to diamonds to uranium, which produces plutonium for nuclear power, is plentiful, available in quantities unmatched anywhere else on the world for imperialism to exploit for capitalist profit at the expense of those resources being available to do what they should be doing, serving the people of the Congo and Africa. To continue this international robbery, imperialism using its police agent agency appendages, appendages like the CIA did everything to try and break the people's confidence in Lumumba and the MNC. When those tactics failed, they brutally assassinated Lumumba. 
when the MNC responded to the loss of Lumumba by initiating guerrilla warfare to fight for the Congo, the CIA resorted to sending anti-Cuban revolution Africans from Cuba into the Congo when these people posed as anti-MNC Congolese fighters. In the case of the American Indian Movement, also known as AIM, in order to sabotage AIM's legitimate efforts to organize the masses living in South Dakota, particularly the Pine Ridge Reservation, the U.S. Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, mobilized and armed an entire group of thugs known as the Guardians of the Ogala Nation, Goon Squad, who unleashed such violence and terror against the people of Pine Ridge that between 1972 and 1976, Pine Ridge had the highest murder rate for anywhere within the U.S. The aftermath of this terrorism was that AIM leadership was pitted against one another, the people of Pine Ridge were pitted against AIM, and unfortunately the fallout was Leonard, Leonard Peltier was illegally framed and continues to serve as one of the U.S. longest held political prisoners for the death of two FBI agents to which he certainly did not commit. Also, the wonderfully young AIM activist Anna Mae Pictaquash was brutally murdered at Pine Ridge among many of the dead. In the case of Anna Mae, her death was carefully carried out and crafted by the FBI to appear to have been the responsibility of AIM leaders. These wounds still exist inside AIM today. Finally, with the upcoming bioptic on the murder of the Black Panther Party Deputy, Deputy Minister Fred Hampton and Mark Clark in Chicago, U.S. many people are already well aware of the U.S.'s government consistent efforts to illegally and immorally destroy the Black Panther Party using tactics from bad jacketing to the case of Hampton, Mark Clark, and others out and out murder. Next slide, please. Police agency arms for capitalism and imperialism have always counted on their ability to turn us against one another as their primary method of causing the level of internal decision required to push movements, organizations to implode. Examples are the four alluded to efforts to convince the indigenous people that AIM leaders like Wabanini, formerly Vernon Belcourt, had a hand in the brutal murder of the beloved anime Atquash. This was accomplished by the FBI sending notes to activists that were designed to appear as if they had came from other AIM people insinuating the worst. Another example is how the FBI sent letters to Huey P. Newton, VPP co-founder, while he was incarcerated suggesting that the Los Angeles Panther leader, Geronimo Gijaga Pratt, was an undercover police agent. These efforts served to push Newton to turn against Panther leaders, against Geronimo, to the point where when the police moved against Geronimo with false charges, Panthers who could have provided evidence of Geronimo's whereabouts in Oakland, at the time the false Santa Monica murder charge was being leveled against Geronimo, refused to speak up on his behalf. Consequently, Geronimo Gijaga spent 27 years in prison based solely on false allegations made against him in court by FBI informant Julio Butler. The jury was never informed that Butler was an informant for the FBI during the trial. Another example of the letters penned by the FBI to be sent between the Panther leadership and the leadership of the US organization led by Milana Karanga. These manufactured antagonisms led to several shootouts where US, I'm sorry, where us and the Panthers in which several Panthers were killed, including LA Panther leader, Al Prentice Bunchy Carter and John Huggins on the UCLA campus in January of 1969. The highly incendiary drawing in the picture shown here was sent to Panther leaders, Bobby Seale and David Hillard immediately after Carter and Huggins were killed. The drawing was sent insinuating that Karanga was the one sending it to the brag about the to brag about the killings when it was actually sent from a regional FBI office in an effort to further escalate violence between the two organizations, which did not result, which did result, excuse me, in several more deaths in 1969 and 1970. Years later, retrieved FBI documents gathered from the Freedom of Information Act after files were liberated from the FBI office in Philadelphia and turned over to the media showed that the FBI agent Richard Held was congratulated and awarded for his ingenuity in facilitating the escalated and violent feud between the Panthers and the US organization. Thank you. Thank you, Shakura. 
So while Shakura was laying out that outstanding groundwork in history, um, <laughs> I just want to let you know, like these white supremacists are really trying to get into this event. And they're, they're waiting to get in. So I hope they wait till they get heart attacks, but we're going to keep moving forward with what we have to talk about. So we want to transition you to talking about how we today unwittingly or maybe some of us wittingly play right into the hands of the police in terms of sabotaging our movements. The difference between today and 50 years ago, the period that Shakura was just talking to us about, is that we didn't know then that there was such a thing as a counterintelligence program. We didn't know that police agencies were organizing to sabotage our movements. We didn't know. We thought that everything that happened that was weird was just people's personalities and egos and behaviors. And some of it was that, but we did not know there was a coordinated effort to sabotage us. The, the problem today is that everybody acts like they know this, like they know this history that Shakur just gave, that they understand that, but yet we still engage in behaviors today that are even more damaging than the behaviors we engaged in 50 years ago, which is really, really, a challenge and that's what we want to spend the remainder of the hour today talking about particularly the question of social media because everybody's on social media for the most part some people aren't but a lot of people are millions of people are no question about that and social media provides an outstanding vehicle to allow people to engage each other on all sorts of levels political level organizing levels social levels everything I mean, I've connected with people from high school. Um, I graduated from high school 40 years ago, and we've been able to connect to the point where we had a very successful 40-year uh, reunion last year. And I still stay contacted with people that I have not physically seen and shared space with since the 1970s. So that's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. And even on the political realm, it provides outstanding opportunities to organize and let people know about events like this one right here. So this is an amazing thing. We have a large number of hundreds of people that join us every Sunday for these sessions. So I don't think that would be the case if we didn't have you know, access to the social media resources that we have. So social media is a wonderful thing, but everything is dialectical, you all, meaning that everything has positives and negatives. And so the negatives about social media are that it does create an environment where people who normally would not say something to you in person feel totally comfortable behind a keyboard saying whatever they want to say about whatever they want to say it about. And so this has created an unfortunate dichotomy in reality where uh, people have license to be passive aggressive and not engage each other in what we call honest face-to-face principled struggle. An honest face-to-face -face principled struggle is one of the most important ingredients to building and maintaining a healthy movement. And if you don't have a healthy movement, we can't move forward. We can't uh, build capacity. We can't continue to advance in our work. And so this concept of honest principled struggle is not happening in social media. And it's creating so many problems for us in terms of our ability to move forward. So many problems that a lot of people that engage in this behavior are either not aware of or just doing what you're doing because you know your, your objective is to do it or anything in between. So we're just gonna examine what that is. So this picture here, obviously, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, whatever we're talking about, YouTube, any social media platform. And the picture on the bottom is these Africans that shot up these police officers. And the reason why I have a picture of them is that oftentimes when these types of things happen, uh, what will happen is that people will start forwarding on social media pictures of people, whether it's people who are at a demonstration, whether people it's de-arrested people, for those that aren't involved in movement work and you don't really know what de-arresting is, it's when the police start to arrest somebody, people are organized to distract the police, physically stop the police from arresting the person, and it's like too many people for the police to do anything about it and nobody get arrested. 
And it's, it's a whole thing, it's a whole skill, it's a whole practice that organizers in this movement practice. Um, I've, I've been able to, I'll just say this, I've been able to observe many people being de-arrested in my time. So what people will do when this kind of stuff is happening is they'll start forwarding pictures on uh, social media of the de-arrest process. And if the people doing the de-arresting don't have their faces covered, then their pictures almost ultimately always end up in the hands of police and they use that information to arrest these people. So this is an example of how people unwittingly do police work for the police. So a, a concrete example is, I, I think it was Minneapolis, the young European woman had set the police station on fire and people forwarding pictures of her doing it and the police use those to arrest her. She's in custody facing felony charges for having done it. And I don't think anybody should ever face any kind of criminal charge for doing anything to a police station. That's just my personal perspective. But she is only because people were so unwitting in terms of not understanding how to not help the put her face out there and help the police. So we're going to talk about some of these things. Y'all y'all got to tell your white Bruce's friends not getting in today. So if you if that's some of you people, you might want to let them know. But um let's talk about, you know, the killing of several Black Lives Matter activists in Ferguson, Missouri since 2014 when the movement evolved. You may or may not know this, but there have been at least seven confirmed people, young people who have died, quote unquote, mysteriously since 2014. And most people don't really know much about that. And there isn't the type of chatter on social media about that that there should be. And I want to say that I think at least part of the reason for that, the lack of attention to that, is that there was so much infighting, personality conflicts that were aired out in social media um, from that you know, those folks that were involved in struggle there that I think it's it created an environment where, they, where these things begin to happen, same as what happened to Geronimo G. Jaga. A lot of people just distanced themselves from it and they didn't, you know, pay attention to it and certainly did not want to get engaged in it. And this is one of the primary tactics or one of the primary results that the police depend upon. Because if they get you disengaged, you don't want to deal with it, you don't want to, then, then they can do whatever they want to people and there's nobody there that's saying like, wait a minute, that we need to deal with that. What's going on there? So that's one thing. And then, you know, this is not a knock. It's great that people are in movements. The protests are great. Everything's great. But the objective reality is that a lot of the people who are engaged in struggle have only started doing this the last five or six years. And because of that, just don't have the historical knowledge of police sabotage of our movement. They might watch a video or two, but that's not giving you historical knowledge of the tactics that they use. And, and the reason why I know it's not, because if you had that, you wouldn't be engaging in the actions you're engaging in. So that's an issue. And then the other issue is just, a lot of, and we'll say this again, of course, we always say it, a lot of the people engaged in organizing work aren't engaged in political education work. You know, this capitalist system, they propagandize us 24-7, 365 days a year. They never stop. They never stop saying voting, 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 voting. They never tell you how you should organize a movement to back any voting you have so that you control the levers. They never talk about that. They just tell you vote, 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 vote. And most of us, because that's all we hear, we don't ever think about anything else other than that. We don't think about, we don't know anything about any other type of work other than voting. We don't know anything about it. We don't even understand work to strengthen the ability of our vote to mean something. We don't even understand that. We don't understand like how do you build a movement that makes your voting process meaningful? Like, so you can hold these people you elect accountable to you. We don't even talk about that. And so that's an example of why political education is necessary. Because if you're engaged in political education, you would be talking about those things. And if we had more people talking about those things, we would be much stronger today than we are. So that's, a, that's an issue that makes for this environment, makes it much more toxic. And then the other thing is that we don't, have the 
type of, because we don't have the political education and we don't have um, the type of a real concrete understanding of why we do this work, then we don't, you know, we get on Facebook and start calling people out on Facebook. Well, this person did this, they did that, this person did this, and we do that on Facebook. None of this is addressed with the person directly. It's done on social media. Then people start saying, then all this bad blood does it. So what this does, you all, is it creates a couple of problems. Number one, it creates really bad feelings on the part of the people who are engaging in the work. The person that's being attacked obviously has bad feelings, whether the accusations are true or not. The person, the people who aren't even engaged in it, who just, you know, are there when it's happening, get bad feelings about it because it just doesn't feel right to them. And the reason why it doesn't feel right to them is it's not honest, principled struggle. That's why. It's just like if someone talks about you behind your back, how do you feel about that? How do you feel about that person? Obviously, you're not going to invite them to dinner. So that's what happens when people are talking about people on social media. They don't necessarily, the, the third party people don't necessarily say anything to you about it because they're just as passive aggressive as you are. But that's the environment that's created. That's the culture that's created is that people can just say all this stuff about people and nothing is done. Now, I'm not saying like some people, you know, they're doing things that need to be outed. I'm not saying not out them, but we're going to talk in a minute about proper, honest, principled ways to out it instead of these on principle ways that do nothing to advance the struggle. Because when people post that kind of stuff on social media, well, this person is an a-hole. They took the money that was raised for the movement and they used it to pay their rent. Okay, that may or may not be true. But what is being accomplished by you putting that on Facebook or Twitter? Like, are they, is that, are they gonna read that and say, you know what, I was wrong, I'm gonna pay the money. No, that doesn't happen. All, all that happens is the things I just got through talking about. So it doesn't help the struggle at all. It doesn't help us advance anything. And then the other thing that happens besides our damaging our ability to interact in a healthy way with one another is that the police monitor all of these channels, you all. They have people who are paid full time to monitor this. Like you all saw that they show it to you. You saw the, uh, the TV show, The Wire. That's just an example of what police do. They monitor every channel. Why do you think it is that they're able to look at pictures you're posting? You're not Facebook friends with these police, but they're able to look at these pictures and identify people. They've done it multiple times. You know, I'm not making this stuff up. So they're able to do that. So you're helping them do that. What you're doing is when you air out your grievances on social media with people, you're providing the police with the weak points in your movement and your organization and giving them the knowledge they need to attack your movement. You might not ever know that they're doing it, but I guarantee you that's what's happening. And just think of it like this. If you've ever been involved in organizing work and you've made some serious progress, you've made some, some you've been able to accomplish some great things, those of you that have done that, you know what I'm about to say. Whenever you get to the point where you're really doing productive work, that's when all these contradictions happen. People start acting a certain way, problems develop, internal conflict with one another. Every time you're on the verge of reaching a higher level of organization, these things happen. Some of that, because we don't know how to handle success, we're much better and handling failure than success. Yes, some of it, some of it is that. So when people are on the verge of having to be accountable to some real work, it's easier for people to just sabotage it than actually deal with what it takes to do the real work. Yeah, that's part of it. But another part of it is that you're being attacked by the police and you don't even know that. They're pitting people against you in various ways. They're talking to people. They have people who are informants. The informants are telling you things about people. You don't know they're an informant. So you're, you're listening to that and you're developing interpretations about people that aren't even true. And it's impacting your willingness, ability and effectiveness to work with these people. So, you know, the solution to this is we have to get to a point where we use political education as a tool to strengthen our ability to avoid falling into that trap. It's like 10 white supremacists trying to get in. And they're so stupid, you all, is that they, they're the same addresses that they used last week. Like, we didn't document that and write that down. Like, that, that's, that's just humorous to me.
like they're always trying to get at us in our work so that's great but it's just funny to me that they could be that dumb like you 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 should not be in 2020 afraid of these people deal with them head on you're stronger than they are. And the biggest weapon they have is frightening you. Why do you think they wear white sheets? Why do you think the Klan didn't want to frighten you? And the moment that we organize and demonstrate to them that we're not afraid of them, that problem is over. So we need political education and we need that to discipline us in these movements. So what does that look like? I'll give you an example. Previously, as some people know, I lived in Portland, Oregon. And in the, here in the United States. And I was able to humbly contribute to the creation of an all African people's revolutionary party chapter up there. I haven't lived in Oregon four years, the chapter's still going, they're still doing work. That's a beautiful thing. I don't even know a lot of people in the chapter there because they've joined since I left. And that is a wonderful thing. As an organizer, that's the best thing that can happen to you, that you help initiate something and then you leave and it continues on and it continues to gain strength. But while I was up there, we had a situation arise where another African organization in Portland, I'm not going to name them um, because that's not important, but another African organization, we were doing a lot of work in, a, in the African neighborhood there in New Columbia. We still do work out there. And one of the young African women who went to high school out there, she came to us and she notified us that someone from this other organization was interacting with her in a way that she felt was inappropriate. And there were a number of, uh, you know, she, this person was much older than, this was a young woman. And so she came to us. And so I'm trying to build an organization. So I'm working with the new people I had there and I'm like talking to them and I'm like, so how do you all want to address this? Now, I knew how I wanted to address it, but I want, you know, it's not just me, it's an organization. So I'm asking them, how do we want to address this? And they were saying things like, well, we should have an event, have food, invite them, ask them how their work is going, blah, blah, blah. And I listened. And then after we got through, I told them, like, I'm not having an event with them to ask them how their work is doing. I want to have a discussion with them to tell them to leave this young woman alone. Like we don't need to do no passive regret, no, no, no uh, um, liberal stuff like that. I want to do an event with some honest, principal struggle. That's what we need to do with them. So we had a meeting with them. There were a number of us, there were a number of them. And we came there and that's what I told them. Like this person says this, you need to stop. And the person's like, well, I didn't mean anything. Like, I don't care what you meant. It's not about what you meant. It's about how they received it. So you need to stop right there. And that was it, you all. That's an example of honest and principled struggle. Is that easy? Of course it isn't easy. Because after I did that, like people in that organization for the time that I was up in Portland, they were, a lot of them refused to, they, like they wouldn't even look at me after that. They wouldn't even speak to me. But you know what? If you're gonna really be serious about engaging struggle for justice, you can't be worried about that kind of, you know, flimsy type stuff. I consider it an honor. Like to me, if they don't want to speak to me after I did that, which I know was the right thing, and they didn't bother the person again, so the objective was achieved, and they didn't want to speak to me after that, then they're doing me an honor by not speaking to me because they're not serious about this struggle. I don't care what they say or what they look like or whatever, they're not serious about this struggle because clearly if somebody comes to you and tells you like, look, this what you're doing is wrong and there's no question that it's wrong you have to respect them and some of them did some of them did have respect after that and that was cool you know but i'm saying like principled struggle is never easy it's never easy the bar is high that's why we don't do it because it's easier to just get on facebook and write something because you don't have to deal with any real consequences it's much harder to go to someone and say, what you're doing is wrong. You need to stop. It's not in the interest of justice or any of that. That's much harder to do. And be honest, you all, most of us don't have the courage and commitment to do that. And there, But we all can, can obtain that. And the way you get it is by constant political education. Because I'm going to tell you this right now, I'm not afraid of no white supremacists. I'm not afraid of this government. I'm not afraid of no. I've been challenged throughout my life by all of them. 
I've been visited by the FBI. I've certainly had more than my share of confrontations with violent white supremacists. I'm not afraid of none of that. The only thing I'm afraid of is dishonoring my ancestors. That is the one fear that a Jammu Umi has. I do not want to live with dishonoring my ancestors. I could not live with myself. And so I would rather deal with you being mad at me for telling you the truth than dishonoring my ancestors. So that comes from the principal ideological struggle because I understand what my ancestors went to to get me to the place that I'm at today. I understand what they went to to get you to the place you're at. And there is no way you're ever gonna get me to dishonor that. So that's why political education is so important because it helps you do that. So let's get this picture here. This is a picture of some comrades in Los Angeles, California, United Snakes. And they are street organization members or what you would call gang members, members of Bloods and Crips sets, the Africans here. The indigenous or what people call Latino uh, comrades in here are members of MS-13 and White Fence and um, indigenous or what they call Latino or Mexican gangs. And what they have done is come together to form an alliance to fight against these efforts that they have come to understand are being originated by police agencies to inflict conflict uh, between our communities. Now, these folks have understand that. We've been saying this for years, right? And they have come to understand that. The minute there's a, you study the history, the minute there's a peace treaty among LA street organizations, there's a drive-by. There's a, there, and if they can't coax that, and, and Shakur already told you how a lot of these drive-bys happen. It's not a real situation, y'all. It's police posing as street organization members who, drive by and do the drive by shooting and then people believe it and then they start engaging in antagonism against each other. But when they're not able to do that, like for example, between Bloods and Chris, they're not successful, then they go to the indigenous people and they, they, they say, let's get some of them to drive into the African neighborhoods and do that. And then now they can generate some funk between our two communities. They've been doing this for decades to us and we don't know it and we fall into it pretty much every time. Well, these comrades have come to say no more. We're not doing that. We're not letting the police, and they go in political education work in their communities saying, don't pit us against you. The, the African people are not our problem. They are not our problem. This capitalist system that stole our land and oppresses us is our problem. And then the Africans are going to, to our people and saying the indigenous people are not our problem. They're, we're on their land. We're on their land right now. And we should be helping them get their land back because the more we do that, the more we are strengthened to get ours back. So that's a whole different discussion. I get that. I know some of you don't get it. You're like, well, I'm not going nowhere. That's not Pan-Africanism has nothing to do with you individually going anywhere. It has to do with us being empowered as a people. And so if you understand the example for people to understand that is just look at Asia today. If you talk about China, Japan, Singapore, Taiwan, those countries are spoken of with respect. You talk about the Philippines, Vietnam, Laos, uh, um, uh, uh, those countries, Cambodia, they don't have the same level of prestige as the first set of Asian countries I mentioned. The question is, why is that? It's because the first set of countries I mentioned are somewhere in other world powers. So their people are respected. So you can't separate it. If you see people from China, and you respect China, you're gonna respect the Chinese people you see from China, even people who are identified from China, if they've never been there, you're gonna respect them on levels that you don't even consciously realize. Whereas if you see the people from the Philippines or Vietnam and they don't have that level of respect and this country fought a 10 year or more war against Vietnam, you're not gonna have the same level of respect for them. So that's the problem we have as African people. It's not about where you live physically or where you're born. It's about a free Africa means a respected Africa and a respected Africa means a respected African people. So just understand that. So sorry, the white supremacists missed that. It was a pretty good message. So they have to get that somewhere else. Uh, so that's what these comrades are doing here. They're not, I lost some of the white supremacists. They gave up. Y'all's relatives giving up. They don't want to 
they, they realize they're not coming in and they don't want they don't want to wait okay well they'll get it somewhere else because they can't stop this they can't stop this fun but um so that's what these folks are doing and so you know if you're gonna be involved in this movement work you can't half-ass it you all you gotta learn how to engage in this principle ideological struggle and so the first rule of thumb is any problem you have with some people don't put it on social media if you haven't addressed it with those people you shouldn't address it at all because you're not really ready to seriously address it because that's the only way to seriously address it is with them and if like you're a woman identifying person for example and there's a man that's abusive not saying you have to address that yourself but get people to address it with you get a squad to address it with this person that at some point you all, there's no way around that. That has to happen to address the issue. So if your organization has no way to do that, that's the first thing you have to figure out. Because if you don't do that, you're not gonna address the problem. All you're gonna do is do these other things you talk about, create other challenges for your ability to do the work. So you don't wanna do that. So you've got to address those people. And we say this all the time, and we'll say it again publicly. If you have an organization and you want to learn how to address these contradictions with people in an honest and principled way, we will help you do that. We will walk with you. We will work with you. We will help you in whatever way we can to learn how to have a comfort level in doing that. I'm putting it out there. All you have to do is reach out to us. So you have no excuse. You have absolutely no excuse. So if you're ignoring what I just said and continuing to put blah blah is uh blah blah and they're not doing this then you're just deciding that you don't care and that you're you don't have the you know you're not politically mature enough or whatever the problem is to engage this work in a healthy way that can help us move forward and you may not mean to do it but when you put that out there like that you're telling the police where the weak points are so that they can attack that and attack you that's exactly what you're doing. And if you want more examples of that, we can give you examples of that all day. So that's what has to happen. And by doing that, you you know, we learn how to engage. You don't think that these comrades in these street organizations had to engage in some real serious struggle. They had people killed on these sides of the lines. You don't think they have to engage in some serious struggle. Most of you haven't even lost a, a, a hangnail in the movement. So if they can figure out how to talk to each other, you can certainly figure out how to talk to each other. So, you know, we've been in a number of these meetings with these street organizations. We've seen the struggle that they engage in. It's highly emotional. It's all of that. This is a beautiful thing. You all, this is what we want. So we just have to stop running from it and embrace it. That's a part of the struggle. You know, I, Shakur is on here. My only child is here. He can tell you that she was raised to see adversity as something that she develops the skills to work through. She was not raised to see adversity as something to avoid. You cannot avoid adversity. Adversity is a part of life. You have to learn how to struggle through it. That's what makes you a stronger person. That's why honest principled struggle is the right road because it makes our organization stronger. And if our organizations are stronger, our movement is stronger. If our movement is stronger, we win, you all. It's just that simple. So even if a resolution isn't possible, like, and sometimes that's the case, like people just refuse to do that. If you engage in these processes, you will develop stronger mechanisms to deal with that, even to the point of, you know, figuring out how to create boundaries with people. That's, that can be done when you have this kind of culture. It's very difficult to do any of this in a passive aggressive culture, but in a healthy culture where principle struggle is the norm you can do this this is what happens in fact they'll help you because they don't want to deal with you because they know you're going to tell them that you're not going to be afraid to tell them the truth so they'll distance themselves from the work you're doing i've seen it happen countless times and so you know you also have to understand that if you don't approach the work in an honest and principled way um you know it just creates corrosive elements around the work you're doing even if the police don't move against you, 
even just from an internal standpoint, you're contributing to the conditions. Because if you don't have honesty, anybody that has a relationship out here of any kind, uh, parent, child, romantic, friendship, whatever it is, work, colleague, whatever it is, the minute there's dishonesty, it corrodes the relationship. Is that right? Of course it is. It corrodes the relationship. There's no trust. There's, and if you don't have trust, you can't build a foundation. So if you don't, if you engage in this passive aggressive posting on the internet, then you, you, you fan the flames of no trust. Because some people are going to say, well, if you do that about them, you'll do the same thing about me. You won't come to me and tell me, and I don't even know I did something wrong. So whatever it is, even with the best of intentions, it just creates a corrosive environment. So it's not healthy for our work. So, you know, again, this question of political organization or education, rather, is that most of, I'm not picking on Black Lives Matter. Um, that's all of our organizations. They're just, that's just the dominant thing today. And I'm saying that there wasn't dominant political education. There isn't dominant political education in Black Lives Matter. There wasn't dominant political education in the Black Panther Party. It's, as, as as much as people think there was, there wasn't. And all you have to do is read the books written by the people who were Panthers, and they all tell you that. Asada Shakur says that in Asada. David Hilliard says that in This Side of Glory. Bobby Seale says that in uh, um, um, Seize the Time. Even Huey P. Newton says it in Revolutionary Suicide. Flores Forbes says it in To Die for the People. Kwame Ture says it in Ready for the Revolution. And I can say that because I read all those books, y'all. And so I know that each of them have taught Elaine Brown and A Taste of Power. They've all talked about the lack of constant political education in the Black Panther Party and how that fueled their destruction. So our movements have to have that. We can't just be they can't just be fueled on anger at what's happening today. That's only going to take you so far. You know, you get out there because you're angry, of course. That's, that's, we all first got out there like that. But you cannot stay in that space. You have to move to a point where you're like, OK, now we, I have to build some capacity in myself and others to be stronger to do this work. And that requires that political education piece. So it's not a knock against anybody. It, it, only in the sense that if we don't mature to the point where we see the necessity to engage that work, then it prohibits our ability to effectively do the work. And, you know, that means that we have to approach this work scientifically. It can't just be 100% emotion. Emotion is great. Emotion is a powerful tool in work for justice, but it cannot just be that. It has to be some science. It has to be a combination. I mean, most you can listen to me and know, well, that's, that's a passionate guy. But I also am driven by science, planning, history. So that what I do is calculated. That's why I'm still here. These people tried to do things with me numerous times. That's why I'm still here, because I had a better level of planning. And all I want to do is have you have that better level of planning. So just like I said, if you want in your organization tools to engage in principle honest struggle then i'm also going to say publicly here that we will help you develop a political education process in your organization we've done that for a number of organizations a number of organizations we've helped indigenous latino youth do that the maryland buck abolitionist collective which is an organization of white radicals in portland oregon we were instrumental in helping originate that organization and provide them, helping them provide them with their political education standpoint. If you don't believe that, ask them. We've done that for years, been doing that for years. So we will definitely do that. That's what we're here to do. But you just have to be serious so that you can learn how to have, develop those tools of analysis to go with that emotionalism, to even guide that emotionalism so that that passion is not wasted. It's, it's directed in a positive and productive direction. That's what we want to do. Because there's just no escaping this need for political education. So we hope that you see that and that you can, you know, see that as a tool to help you strengthen yourself, your organization, your movement, and us as a, a community of people. So that's that's what we're saying. And we just want to tell you um, as we get ready to close, I just want to ask Shakur, do you see anything out there that we need to be 
speaking to, I, I don't see anything. No, um, nothing at this time. There's good comments on Facebook, but very positive comments. So thank you all for that. And so I just want to say two things. One, should I let the white supremacists in as we're getting ready to leave? <laughs> just when we're getting ready to sign off, I should let them in. Uh, that would be funny. They're still trying. Like, you know it's white supremacists because why would you wait the whole time of the event and you haven't been let in? Like, that that can only mean that you ain't nobody. Look, I do this work every day. I, I, I would love to encounter people that are enthusiastic about participating in the work, but that's just not a reality. Like, and I already knew the names because I knew them from last week when they did what they did but um yeah i think I, I i should just wait to the end and just let them in right when we close maybe i'll do that but we want to say to you all that uh again this process of political education we want to provide you with resources and we have these resources we communicate to you every week and we strongly ask you to support these resources these are independent revolutionary african voices and what i mean by independent not commentators on CNN. You know, CNN is owned by the majority of the, the stock of CNN is owned by the Rockefeller family. All of the NBC affiliates, of which CNN is one of them, is owned by the Rockefeller family. The Rockefeller family owns uh, Chevron. They own Chase Manhattan Bank. You are not gonna get an objective. I don't care who's on there. I don't care if they have Cornell West or whoever's on there. Oh, anybody, any African that's on CNN is because they're not going to say what really needs to be said. There are no revolutionaries on CNN. You have never, you can't communicate. Tell me when you've had one revolutionary on CNN. And if you think that they are, you don't know what a revolutionary is. That has not happened. So you got to ask yourself, why is that? Why has that not happened? Why do they only have certain voices? Like just basic things y'all can ask yourself. Like Oprah Winfrey had a show for 30 years in Chicago. I don't care what you think of Louis Farrakhan, you can't deny his impact on our community. She, he was never once on her show in 30 years, right there, right down the street from her. You gotta ask why that is. Like that would seem, that's strange to me. Like if you're trying to say that she's there to try to address all the issues, well, she can't have him on there because it would cause problems with her advertisers. So you are not gonna see revolutionaries on CNN. That is not gonna happen. So these are voices that are independent and we have limited resources. So if you don't support our you know, uh, limited efforts to reach people, we'll never get the word to people. So we rely on you all. So if you want information, you wanna join the All African People's Revolutionary Party, please go to our site here aprp-intl.org. If you're African, you got to be African to join the APRP. We're trying to deconstruct colonialism. And anybody that's white that is for a better world will understand and respect that, right? Like I'm not going to trans organizations or LGBTQ organizations or women's organizations or indigenous organizations or Asian organizations demanding let me join them. All that's doing is creating a lot of unnecessary energy that's not productive. I want to be, help them build up the strong organizations in their communities, because the stronger the organizations are in their communities, the more that helps me. We don't have to be in the same place doing the same thing. That's, that's absurd. If, if you're in a house with some people and somebody attacks the house, you go, well, let's all just run out the front door. That's the worst strategy you can employ. Why would you not dig a tunnel? and come up behind the attackers. Some, some go on the roof, some go to the window, attack them from all different angles. We don't have to be in the same place. Just if we're not in the same place doesn't mean we're not doing the same thing against the enemy. So this is an African organization, but if you're not African and you wanna start an organization, we already said, we'll help you do that. So please don't leave here and go tell the white supremacists waiting to get in. Like they don't, they're racist. They don't wanna let us be in. That's not what's happening here. We said it a number of times, we'll help you start an organization. We just want you to organize in white communities because the fact that that's not happening, that's why these white supremacists are here and trying to sabotage us right now because no white people are organizing them with these ideals we're talking about. So that's why we know that needs to happen. We've been dealing with these people for a long time, you all. They're not just people on TV to us. So we know what needs to happen. So that's why that needs to happen. So you can 
time, reach out to us. You can reach out to me, a better world.me. The white spiritists reach out to me. Why don't you all do it? Let me know if you need help organizing. I'm tired of just clicking and just seeing white spirits. Like I told the other day, he called me the N-word. I'm like, that's the best you finally use. That's the best insult you got. Like I'm tired. I have way better people than you call me that. Like I'm I'm really disappointed. You gotta do better. Come back and call me something better. Do better next time. So we need some of y'all to come in. Let us know if you're interested in talking. We can do that. A better old down me. Then hoodcommunist.org, which is an outstanding revolutionary organization. They done call the police on us. An outstanding revolutionary organization that is writing outstanding literature. I'm one of the people that contributes there. I encourage you to do the same. Revolutionaries for various organizations across the sphere. So the last thing we'll say today is, again, the tools. Do not write anything adverse about any organization or anybody on social media. If you have not addressed the contradiction with the people engage, that's a challenge that you need to address full on. If you cannot do it by yourself, get a crew to do it. If you don't know how to do it, reach out to people like us who can help you learn how to do that. We, if we don't do this, you all, we are digging our own graves in this movement. We're destroying our own organizations and we're helping police do the same thing. So if you're sincere about waging a struggle for justice and not helping our enemy tear us down and not tearing us down from within, you have got to get on board with this message immediately. You've got to get on board with that. And so with that, we will get ready to say good evening to you. We wanna wish you a great evening. We really hope you reach out if you need help. We really hope you practice these. We really hope you spread this around. We'll have a video, we'll post it. So it'll be on YouTube so you can refer people to this. It'll be under the same title of Stop Doing Police Work Against Movements. So you'll be able to see this if you think it's worthwhile. We hope that you do. And we wanna thank each and every one of you. We had a really uh, large audience this week and we appreciate each and every one of you. We hope you understand that we are doing this because we want to make a, a further contribution to political education. We talk about it all the time. We, we think it's the most important thing we can be doing right now. People are talking about guns and all this stuff, but none of that is important right now if you don't have the right ideas in your head. So we need to focus on that right now. I don't even want to be by nobody with no gun if they're not politically educated. You probably turn around and shoot me. They'll tell you, you know, my, my family, I love my family, but my sister has zero political education. And if the police told her that I was a terrorist, she, yeah, he always, he was always into that African stuff. And yeah, he was, she'd be the first one to, to, to agree with that. That's because we lack political education. This is the key, you all, until we recognize this and achieve it, we'll, we'll never grow beyond the splintered element that we're at right now. We hope you are well and healthy. We wish you well. Stay strong. We'll be back next week with another dynamic uh, topic. And we wish you the best. Stay strong. Keep your mental, physical, and spiritual health forward ever, backwards, never. Have a good rest of your evening.